next speaker is Kenneth D. Cole, partner in Cole Matat Architects, Fort Wayne, Indiana. He will be talking to us, among other things, I suppose, about the sod house, an underground dwelling using energy conserving approach to design with passive solar and wood burning technology as a backup system. See how this is working. Is the sound coming across all right? No. How about now? That sounds better. I can hear myself now. Uh, the size of the offices are getting smaller, so are the projects. Uh, this one is uh, 36 foot square, and it's a little bit smaller than the other ones we've been looking at. But I, I hope you'll find it interesting at least. Uh, we certainly had a great deal of, of fun and learned a lot working on it. We had a client that came to us, Dave and Krista Hockensmith is their name. And in fact, David is here with us today and had any question period. If somebody's got some questions, how is it to live? Uh, I can't really say underground, because this isn't. Uh, but in this situation, he certainly can answer it. In fact, a lot of the research for the house itself was done by Dave before he ever came to us. He brought us uh, a lot of articles and ideas and concepts and a lot of things we talked about. And what we wound up with, I'll get into with some slides here uh, right directly. Uh, the site is, on, uh, is rural. Uh, it's off between Columbia City and South Whitley which I suppose tells everybody in this room precisely where it is. Um, it, uh, on about 20 acres, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, of, of land, uh, there's an orchard he planted at the time. He already had on the site a, a barn and a greenhouse, and since has built another greenhouse. Uh, they raise bees, chickens, uh, herbs, and uh, Lots of plants which they sell besides working to make a living and also spending time supplying energy in the form of physical effort in the continuing effort with the, with the house. Uh, I think with those remarks we'll get into the slides if I can have the, the lights and uh, which, uh, oh, oops, okay. Uh, it's actually a berm house with a sod roof. Uh, it was built on top of, of um, the highest ground around. It's not a, uh, sort of a hill, but not exactly. Uh, in this slide, as you can see, approaching it from the road, uh, you can see in the corner uh, the, one, the first greenhouse, which is already there. The house itself is a square form. Uh, this is looking from the orchard side towards the house. It berms up, but it opens completely around on all four sides with a narrow band of, of usually windows, uh, a few cases of, of fixed panels. And the windows are, are either operable or fixed insulating glass, depending on the uh, ventilation pattern we were after. We uh, tried to save as much money as possible. And it's uh, cheaper to install a fixed piece of glass, and you have less problem with infiltration with that. So where we could did not need ventilation, we did that. The monitor you see up on top is a summertime uh, ventilation uh, device. Uh, all of these uh, you know, techniques have been, were, have been spoken about this morning. Uh, most of them are from a long, long proven history of use. Uh, the site plan here, as you, as you can see, uh, the basic approach was, was a a double square. The house is a square, and then the berm uh, up around it continues the slope of the roof, the hip roof. And then at the entrance portion of the house and to the southwest is an entrance court where the berm pulls away from the house around a front porch. Uh, the idea here that the summer winds would come through the funnel between the uh, woods or the wooded area trees and the barn and enter the opening of the house there. Uh, for, for ventilation in the summer. Uh, there is a back door from the house that leaves from the master bedroom. We angled the berm of that when you leave that door to, to cut it off from, as much as possible from the winter winds. Uh, we read the textbooks on which way the wind blows like others. At least we try. Uh, as 
this was shortly after it was built, uh, which was four years ago now. Uh, I have a few things we've learned. One of them is that uh, when part of the sod roof is over an unheated area, such as the front porch, uh, it freezes off sometimes, and now we've got some weeds growing there instead of uh, sod. Uh, the other one is, is the one that other people have warned us about, and that's uh, there are a few leaks, and it's uh, sometimes a little hard to find them. I'll get into that <laughs> a little bit later. The pipe with a hook end on it, as you see uh, in the, well, not exactly in the foreground, but this side of the house is the plumbing vent from the house. We didn't really want to stick it up through the side, so we brought it out away from the house and, and put a shepherd's crook out there. Uh, Dave, you don't have the goats yet to go with that, do you? Okay. It stands out more noticeably in the wintertime, as you can see. Uh, in fact, uh, now these are some slides that, that Dave had taken and, and, and uh, let me borrow for this presentation. This, I think you probably recognize as this last winter. I think as the snow started to melt, Krista told me you had some pretty good ice curtains outside those windows at times. This is towards that, that rear entrance. Let's see. Uh, the plan of the house itself is, is essentially pretty simple. Uh, there's fireplace and uh, oops, fireplace in the center. With, it was a heatilator type fireplace, and it didn't work, or rather, it used too much uh, too much wood and lost too much heat up the flue. And so later on, Dave installed a Swedish wood burning fireplace or stove in the master bedroom, and, and I'll get into that in a moment also. But the, uh, as you can see, it's a square house with one corner cut out for an entry porch, uh, living kitchen, country kitchen type area off that entry. Two bedrooms or a bedroom and a studio, or two studios as the case might be, uh, to the left, and then to the top, the master bedroom, a uh, small nook or cave area which uh, is used as a writing area or a private area, and a, and a bath. Uh, one of the things that was kind of fun with it, in the berm we buried a root cellar, and access to it is by a uh, bench, uh, insulated bench that, that's hinged and, and rises up, and then you go down a ladder into the, into the root cellar, which is in the lower, lower right. Uh, that fireplace platform in the center is a raised over the mechanical and storage space. There are water heaters in there, the electric meters in there, and things like that. And then the platform is in the middle is a, the library and stacked full with books and research and a drawing table and so on. Uh, there's that corner over the, over the porch that I was talking about. This was taken uh, about a week ago. And as you can see, this spring, a lot of that has died back again. The bank on the inside of the terrace is covered with rocks and ground cover is planted and, and will be growing soon. Uh, in, in the section, as, you can, as I mentioned, it is a berm house, essentially. And the, and the roof construction is, is heavy timber, uh, actually cut locally and, and rough sawn locally. And the uh, offal from the heavy timber beams was used to make planks in which the doors are made out of, build up doors, and some of the paneling it around the perimeter where there, is, uh, where there aren't windows. Uh, the, ex their, uh, the roof then is ten, or two by six TNG decking. Uh, and the roof membrane of, of multiple layers of, of visqueen and cold applied uh, tar products which came out of some of the writings that, that, that Dave had gotten. And I think we should have done more than that. One of the things is when the workmen were spreading the dirt before actually laying the final sod, I think few of our roofs came from careless use of shovels. Uh, but anyhow, as that may be, that's the case. And I would suggest two things if, you, if you're going into this. I'd put more depth to my sod, even more yet. Uh, which would, of course, increase the weight, increase the, increase the structure you'd have to build. But I think uh, that would give it more inertia and better chance to survive the temperature changes and so on. Uh, 
I do believe, I think Dave told me, that directly above the refrigerator in the kitchen, the sod is always the greenest, which means stove. Stove and, OK, right, but where you generate heat in the kitchen. Uh, so there is some heat transfer through, the, you know, through that much, and at least helps, uh, helps it keep it alive during the winter. Uh, the, found, the walls are eight inches of concrete lined on the inside with uh, uh, inch and a half of styrofoam and then covered with uh, gypsum board. Uh, you can, uh, the, the narrow windows, which are not very high, but are at, at eye level at, at, uh, when you're standing up, do give an, a surprising amount of sense of light within the space. I, I've been very pleased with the result unless you underexpose your photograph, of course. Uh, but very pleased with the, with the sense, the ambient sense of, of light in the space when, it's, when it was finished. Uh, I think maybe Dave could speak to that more directly. There's the uh, wood-burning fireplace with the, you know, the heat uh, metal lining with the ducts in it. Dave found that uh, to use that as a supplementary heat source, it used, uh, you know, too much of it goes up the flue, I think, as, as we all know. Uh, so he did uh, purchase one of these Swedish uh, wood-burning stoves. Uh, one of the nice features, I think, of the heavy framing that we had to use to hold up the sod is you can hang your seats from it if you wish and don't have to set them on the floor. Uh, it worked out quite nice. Uh, this is the master bedroom area. Fantastic bed that uh, Dave and Chris have found. This is the back wall of that fireplace where the ladder's up to the library I mentioned, and uh, where, uh, taken before the, the advent of the stove, uh, and there is the stove on the ceiling and the pipe going down into the ground. And uh, maybe if we back that up, somebody could turn it over. Uh, Uh, I might talk a little bit about that. That you know, I don't think I mentioned the uh, supplementary heat is electric baseboard. <laughs> uh, I can see you do that with a water bed. Uh, since the uh, since the insulation of the stove, except when they are gone for prolonged periods of time, and let's say in excess of 24 hours or something like that. Uh, the electric heat does not come on, according to Dave. It's turned down to about 50 degrees and, and, and never comes on except when deliberately turned on in the bathroom. That stove, and here's a close-up of it, and it's going to sound like a pitch now because I still can hardly believe it. Uh, it indicates anyhow that the uniform, the smoothing out effect of the mass and the underground design of the building that I think is a major factor how this uh, works so well. But uh, he says it keeps the house at uh, my notes here somewhere around 65 to 68 degrees during the day, and I know the first winter they put it in, they they kept the house warmer than that with it. He talked about up into the low 70s. Uh, I think he found he uh, maybe was using had to go to the stove too often and throw in another piece of wood. But anyhow, uh, 65 to 68 degrees. Uh, it loses approximately five degrees temperature overnight while they're sleeping in the house on, on very cold and windy nights, such as we've had this winter. So the, the berming, the sod roof, the, uh, you know, the, the energy conscious efforts in the design of the house have to be working if this, if this will do this. I, uh, this is our monitoring system. Uh, the, the other amazing part is, is Dave picks up his uh, hardwood lumber, which scraps from a, from a hardware, uh, or hardwood uh, mill in the, in the area. Costs him about $2 a pickup truck load, and it takes about two trucks for a cord of wood. And he uses about three and a half cords a winter. That comes to a fuel cost of $15 to $16 a winter. Uh, of course, uh, everybody starts doing this. We're going to run out of trees, and the cost of hardwood is going to go up skyrocketing. But 
as long as there's only a few doing it, uh, I think it's rather amazing. I think uh, yeah, it's just another shot of the of the front door and the glass besides uh, the door out to the porch. And, uh, I might mention we are just now finishing a hot air system, uh, which, uh, like some other people mentioned, the main reason it's on there is PR. The guy wants to sell, uh, quote, energy conscious cars from the sales office. So it's a car sales office using, using uh, I won't get into that. Uh, I think it turned out pretty nice, and, and actually it was worked on by a student here at, at uh, Ball State while he was on his intern, Kevin Smith. So you might be interested in that. And my last slide is a, is a non-energy responsive house that I pass on the way to, to Dave's house. Uh, uh, it's just a comment of uh, what happens when you don't respond to energy, although I love that form. It's one of my favorite house forms. With that, uh, uh, we can have the lights again, I think. And uh, tried to keep it brief, and I'll open it up, to, I guess, to, to any questions. It's been an interesting project, and I think uh, oh, I, I, I probably should mention that it works pretty nice in the summertime, too. It stays quite cool and very pleasant. Yeah. We've got 10 inches. And I would, I would, and I'm, I got, you know, no design for this. Just see the pants. I'd, I'd probably up that to 16 to 24 now. Just, I think it would have more stability. And, of course, some kinds of uh, underground designs, which you've seen, and, and uh, incidentally, the issue of uh, AIA Journal that we got in the mail yesterday is full of uh, examples, some good examples of passive and underground designs. I think, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll summarize that. The question was, uh, is do you have a problem with humidity? And I think anybody that lives in Indiana has a problem with humidity. But uh, Dave says, especially the first summer, yes. They need, in fact, they need a humidifier to, humidifier to draw out the, the excess humidity. And they do uh, run a circulation fan in addition to the natural ventilation we had to, a small one to keep it uh, down. Where, where was it coming from? Through the walls? Uh, that and partially, and we had some problem with groundwater in that root cellar, which w just had a door over it, and I think a fair amount of it was coming from there until Dave did put in a sump pump in there to, to keep the water out of there. We had a little, a few inches of water in the bottom of that root cellar the first couple of years. W were the walls uh, waterproofed, parged? Yes, they were parged, and, but, and, a, and a perimeter tile system down to lowland I, I, uh, out, but uh, we did have a little of that. Yeah. Yeah. Do the walls and roof have any insulation other than the layer of wood? The roof does not. Well, the inch and a half of wood is not bad, you know, as a starter. Uh, the walls do have an inch and a half of styrofoam glued direct to the concrete. So we have, we have the, you know, the the high thermal efficient plus the mass. Really? <laughs> Come on. It's not, it's not as much as, I, I guess I should summarize it. The question was, is there insulation in addition to the earth? <laughs> and I said, not on the roof. And I said, there was an inch and a half of styrofoam on the walls. And the client says, there's not. He says, there's an airspace. And that, did we? Okay. Okay, he says, we space the interior insulation away from the concrete wall with an airspace and then rigid insulation and, and drywall. Some of that work was done 
Uh, well, there were some, Dave did some of the work himself. Contractors did some. We visited it some. I don't. I'll take your word for it. There, you were there while it was being built, okay. but so was I. <laughs> four, only four years ago. God, yes. Okay. Well, uh, we had some problems afterwards, and uh, haven't really s determined what you know what all the causes were. It was living sod. Yeah. The question was was uh, did you have problems with the sod, and what was there a special sod used? And, uh, paraphrasing, but essentially that was it. It was locally or area grown sod from the sod farm that was put on top of, of, of excavated earth from the site spread on the, on the deck to make up, there's like maybe eight inches of, of local topsoil that came off the hill before the house was built, then put back onto the roof. And then uh, the two inch, uh, you know, the rolled up uh, sod farm sod was, was put on top of that. Uh, it was our thinking that what would happen would happen. Uh, we hope to see eventually wildflowers and, and, and seasonal type things start growing there. Uh, although I must admit, and jokingly, one of the early sketches I gave the client showed somebody walking on the roof with a lawnmower. We did not really intend for it to be cut. Uh, we have talked often about when the goats come, they could be tethered up there. But the long grasses, of course, if they grow, will help your insulation a great deal. Uh, they trap air. They, they, you know, they do a good job of, of, of providing a layer of still air and insulation on top of the earth itself. Uh, it's really our basic conclusion that, that, the, that these, the severe winter before last that we had, we got some excessive freezing of dormant grass and, and it died during the winter except where there was enough heat from the house to you know to keep it from uh, total freeze out uh, that's the only thing we can figure on on some of it and that's about the best answer I can give you we haven't gone into it any deeper now yeah Dave okay client says it's Scott's Windsor blue and he did cut it the first summer to encourage growth and root, root penetration into the, into the lower dirt. Yeah. OK, that's something I meant to talk about. Yes, he asked if there are any special details of maintaining dirt and sod on the roof. Uh, at the bottom of the slope, we, we bolted on to our beams a, uh, a heavier beam, a ring beam like, to retain the dirt from sliding off. In the V shape, where the, uh, you know, at the, at the bottom of the slope all around, we ran the, the membrane up and around and then filled it with pebbles, gravel, in that small area to serve as a weep, and then punctured at the center of every four foot bay between each beam a copper tube out to weep that very bottom for heavy saturated areas. It does weep. Uh, I don't know what has caused the problems, but we've had a lot of leaks other than through the weeps. And Dave has once peeled back the dirt and tried to repatch the, the ceiling around there, but we are getting water leaking other places than at the weep. And I think that's something that eventually is going to have to be solved, or that ring beam at least is going to have to be replaced one of these years because of, of rotting. Uh, it's pretty heavy. I think it's going to last a long time before it rots out to the point where it won't function. But Aesthetically, some people are bothered by uh, wood rotting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pardon, I didn't understand. Yeah. The yeah, gentleman suggested the use of bentonite around that root cellar area to keep the water out. And it, and it would probably work, except at this stage it means re-excavating and, and, you know. Yeah. Can you tell us what the 
Yeah, between the side and the deck, and that's that's where I think I think we made one mis mistake. We coated the deck with uh, uh, cold applied tar roof cement type, you know, uh, adhesive or coating. Laid black visqueen in it, and then another layer of cold applied, and another layer of black visqueen, and then another layer of cold applied. Uh, thinking one of the big problems, and and from the writings that David found on sod roofs, or recent side roofs, one of the big problems with, with them is root penetration to whatever you're waterproofing is and, and getting through. And the writings, and I forgot the name of the, the articles that were on this, but he found that visqueen worked best to prevent this. I think even under that visqueen I would put a, uh, a more conventional build-up membrane to start with as insurance, if you will, uh, because we've had some problems at the top and the bottom mostly, though, which I think you know, with time you can you can eliminate by patching. But you know, one, one of the I, I think I'm over exaggerating this. Uh, at least I think I hope the client is, because every time I go there, I can't see any evidence of leaks inside the house. But he keeps telling me they're there. Somebody else had their hand up. Moment. Yeah, one of the yeah. one of the other uh, ceiling materials is uh, Malcolm Wells, who does a lot of underground buildings in the East Coast, is utilizing just a butyl rubber sheeting that's that's applied onto the concrete and, uh, and with a mastic in between it. And it, his comments on it: if you're going to use butyl rubber sheeting, make sure that that mastic is applied 100% of your surface area because you will get a little raising effect and you'll get water into that that concrete then. Yeah, I would think maybe the uh, EPDMs would work even better at that. Then. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, this was uh, designed five years ago, and no. Oh, he, he asked if the question was, uh, did we consider use of Carlisle or, or uh, Trocal type system? And, and the answer is no, because they weren't much talked about at the time we did it. Might say I'd see some even that might be a better use for those systems. At least they wouldn't be subjected to the temperature differential they are on the loose laid systems they're trying on now, where they don't work. Uh, okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs>